Hey everybody, welcome back. We are continuing on with Emerson. We're now going to spend a little time with his um, work and address, sometimes called the Divinity School Address. This is a uh, speech that he gave at Harvard to the graduating class of uh, the Divinity School. Um, for those that don't know, uh, Divinity School um, or seminary or theological uh, you know, school is a is a, a place where one receives um, religious training, uh, particularly for the purposes of going into vocational ministry. People are going to become, um, you know, ministers, pastors, uh, preachers, um, and you know that it's important to note that because of the content of this uh, of this address, um, it's it's highly controversial. You know, after Emerson gives this gives this speech, he gets banned from Harvard. Um, you know, for you know a couple of decades, I believe. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, that's 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 a good indication that what he gets into was uh, some ideas that weren't uh, you know weren't well received by while, while the students um, you know very much seem to. Uh, enthusiastically received what what he was was he was saying um the uh, the administration and the um you know probably the board of trustees um weren't such a fan so you know keeping in mind that context and that audience uh let's uh, let's take a look i i i want to start by reading the opening passage um so it's a little it's, it's a little bit long um but i just want you to hear the language um, for a couple of reasons. One, because the, the particular things that he's talking about um, play into his sort of uh, natural theology, if you will, um, and his, his transcendental um, variation of a natural theology. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think with a thinker like Emerson, a writer like Emerson, it's not really, uh, as we talked about with self-reliance, um, and it's, this is in line with his, his, his thinking, his philosophy, um, you know, content is almost of a, a secondary nature. It's not unimportant, like we said last time, but that the sentiment that it instills, instills or that it evokes, um, which happens primarily by way of, you know, um, the, the powerful presentation, you know, the, the actual beauty of the artwork, you know, the actual exquisiteness or um, you know, shocking nature of the prose of writing. Um, that 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 we need to pay heed to. Um, and and if you're wondering why that is, like if it's hard to get your head around that, think of it like music or a song that you really like. You know, to to want to reduce everything that you read to a series of bullet points in terms of what it's about. It's like taking a song and saying, okay, what's what's the point of verse one, bullet point number one, and verse number two, bullet point number two, chorus, what's, what's, what's the point, right? What's the takeaway, right? And then like saying, you don't have to listen to the song, you don't have to like try to feel it and tr like, you know, uh, be aware of the register that you're sort of hearing it in, right? That it's just, uh, yeah, what's the content, right? And that is not, that's not what music is about. That's not how one enjoys music. That's not uh, the power that it wields over us in our lives. And um, so too with uh, certain types of writing, um, it really is tied to, you know, the words that are selected and how they're organized and, you know, how they start and stop and how uh, sentences and paragraphs transition into one another or fail to do so. Um, so... Those are some of the reasons why we're going to, you know, take a few minutes to read this opening paragraph or or also why we we um, read just certain passages at length at all that on one hand, we're getting uh, a sense of the voice of the authors that we're reading. And also, it's just a good interpretive um, practice to tie your thoughts about to tie your um understanding of, of a book to, to actual passages of the material. You know, too often people just sort of 
you know, try to do some sort of Google search <laughs> for, you know, takeaways or content. And the act of actually reading and understanding is not something that they, they work through. And so it, um, it, it oftentimes results in a superficial understanding um, or, you know, uh, perhaps even worse than a superficial understanding, is that it lulls someone into a sense that they can rely uh, more heavily on secondary um, interpretations and not you know by not doing that work themselves and so their own process of understanding which reading thinking writing interpreting develops that sense of understanding you have to take something that's implicit and you got to make it explicit right and you know I could say a lot more about that but I probably talked more about it than you even wanted me to so saying that uh, this is page 63 um, the beginning of an address. <clears throat> so we're, we're reading it. It was published, you know, obviously, um, you know, with, with this, this collection of Emerson. But just keep in mind, it was originally, you know, given as oratories. It was like much of Emerson's work originally given as a public uh, lecture. You know, it was, it was performed in that way. In this refulgent summer, it has been a luxury to draw the breath of life. The grass grows, the buds burst, the meadow is spotted with fire and gold in the tent of flowers. The air is full of birds and sweet with the breath of the pine, the balm of Gilead and the new hay. Night brings no gloom to the heart with its welcome shade. Through the transparent darkness, the stars pour their almost spiritual rays. Man under them seems a young child and his huge globe a toy. The cool night bathes the world as with a river and prepares his eyes again for the crimson dawn. The mystery of nature was never displayed more happily. The corn and the wine have been freely dealt to all creatures, and the never broken silence with which the old bounty goes forward has not yielded yet one word of explanation. One is constrained to respect the perfection of this world in which our senses converse. How wide, how rich, what invitation from every property it gives to every faculty of man in its fruitful soils, in its navigable sea, in its mountains of metal and stone, in its forests and all woods, in its animals, in its chemical ingredients, in the powers and path of light, heat, attraction, and life. It is well worth the pith and heart of great men to subdue and enjoy it. The planters, the mechanics, the inventors, the astronomers, the builders of cities, and the captains, history delights to all. Lovely, um, a really nice way of thinking about um, the earth, of thinking about nature, of you know trying to draw out from his uh, listeners or readers a a sense of respect and awe for nature um, that we see that he wants us to awaken to what's going on in nature, right? That he feels that something powerful is going on there. And we sort of already know this with what we said, you know, um, with, with, with the romantic influence on the transcendentalists and upon Emerson. <clears throat> um, we also see he's sort of championing the various human uh, vocations and responses that are, that are, um, well, the responses to, to nature and to sort of social um, needs, right, to, to various ways in which we interact with and wrestle with and sort of try to, you know, order and put to use um, nature and natural processes. Now, the question, though, is what does this have to do with religion? What does this have to do with God? We don't, we don't, there's no mention of God. Again, he's, he's speaking to divinity school students, students that are going to go on to, um, you know, be Christian ministers, um, um, Unitarian, if I'm not mistaken, right? And that you would think he might talk about God, he might talk about Jesus, you know, right, right from the get-go. He, he might uh, 
have something more overtly um, religious or theological to say. But again, his religion, his theology has become one that is in um, accord with nature. And it's not sort of setting up the divine in some sort of uh, relationships that's, that's separated from or even in sort of like contention with nature, as though nature is some sort of like, you know, fallen, um, you know, uh, some sort of fallen grand phenomenon that's separated from some sort of like eternal reality, right? Whether you're thinking about that in Christian terms or Platonic terms. Um, and so this is a, a, a championing of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a comportment or an attitude towards nature in which all the religious sentiment is it's here, right? It's imminent. It's in, it's in, this, it's in this place, right? There, there is no, there's no place else. Um, he goes on to say, uh, but when the mind opens and reveals the laws which traverse the universe and make things what they are, then shrinks the great world at once into a mere illustration and fable of this mind. What am I? What is? Ask the human spirit with a curiosity new kindled but never to be quenched. I mean, Emerson is saying that with the right attitude and the right eyes, right, right sensibilities, nature elicits from us wonderment at its at its laws and its principles wonderment at its you know natural beauty and what happens is is that it 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 provokes us to ask these fundamental questions like like what am i you know what is that in the course of ordinary daily life we oftentimes aren't asking those sorts of questions we just uh, you know we take we, we take some sort of given explanation um, and just sort of file it away and, you know, we, we think of ourselves in terms of a scientific classification of a, of a creature or species of some sort. Um, you know, perhaps we have a sort of religious view that just sort of explains it and like, okay, this is, so this isn't, this isn't a question that we have to ask. But this is tied to the profound experience of actually being um, alive whatsoever for Emerson that the, these, these big questions, these fundamental questions, and not just Emerson, most philosophers, um, most anyone who, uh, you know, takes their life, um, you know, seriously as a, as a project that has to be lived, that, uh, you know, we want to be attuned to nature in such a way as it elicits these questions um, and sort of get about, get about that really interesting and unique work that only, you know, you can undertake for yourself. He goes on to say in the next paragraph, a more secret, sweet, and overpowering beauty appears to man when his heart and mind open to the sentiment of virtue. And that's, that's key. Um, because the way that Emerson is going to talk about religion, right? Again, on one, on one hand, it's in these sort of naturalistic terms, right? It's really all about nature. But like if, he's, if we're going to pin it down a little bit more, the, the heart of religion um, for, Emer for Emerson is the sentiment of virtue, or sometimes you could call it the more, he'll call it the moral sentiment. And that is the feeling um, towards that which is virtuous or good, towards moral uh, life, right? That what religion should really do is awaken a sort of um, a, a, a most basic and profound and powerful um, feeling or desire for virtue to to be good you know not not good in the usual sense that we think about a, a conforming sense of morality like oh this is you know everybody's told me I have to do this I have to do this and you know sort of habituated or guilted into behaving a particular way but that through powerful interaction um, with nature that awakens us to these most um, fundamental questions of existence that what will come out is a desire for a beautiful life, you know, um, which is a virtuous life in his estimation. And again, in the estimation of, you know, classical philosophy as well. Um, if you go to the next page, um, and you look at the second, well, let's look at, let's look at, let's look at that top paragraph. He says, um, that which he venerates, this is the top of page 64, 
That which he venerates is still his own, though he has not realized it yet, he ought. He knows the sense of that grand word, though his analysis fails to render account of it. When in innocency, or when by intellectual perception he attains to say, I love the right, truth is beautiful within and without forevermore, virtue, I'm thine, save me, use me, tell me, uh, thee will I serve day and night, in great, small, that I may not be virtuous, but virtue. Then is the end of creation answered, and God is well pleased. I mean, he's trying to say something like, when this awakening to the sentiment of virtue happens, that we no longer want to, will no longer be like satisfied with being virtuous as some sort of like, you know, uh, description, uh, you know, like adjective or something. Um, that um, really we we want to actually we want we want to fully embody virtue like that that's what we are we are the living embodiment um of 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 the good right and in whatever mode that, that that might arise assuming that you know you've got multiple sort of you know like attributes or or, or modalities of goodness that uh, just just to possibly things like you know um forgiveness or um you know uh mercy or patience or justice or you know uh, things like that right um we, we could quibble about that list but just the idea that 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 fitting and good um, action or responses would be um you know sort of particular to the circumstances that that and how it would present like what it would look like so what's good in this instance would look like right speaking truth to power or in this instance you know forgiving your enemies or you know whatever it might be. Um, he says uh, in the next paragraph, the sentiment of virtue, and again, we're you know reading out of our modern library edition on page 64. He says, the sentiment of virtue is a reverence and delight in the presence of certain divine laws. It perceives that this homely game of life we play covers under what seem foolish details, principles that astonish. The child amidst his baubles is learning the action of light, motion, gravity, muscular force. And in the game of human life, love, fear, justice, appetite, man, and God, they interact. He says these laws refuse to be adequately stated. They will not be written out on paper or spoken by the tongue. I mean, think about that. Like he's, he's talking about how this is naturally occurring, like using children at play, like, you know, even perhaps prior to them learning specific you know, games that just when they are out there instinctually doing whatever it is that, that comes, uh, you know, naturally to them, that they're learning. They're learning, they're learning how fast they can run. Um, they're learning how, <laughs> how loud they can scream, <laughs> unfortunately. That they're testing the limits of their human powers, right? Um, and this is something that their experiences but beyond their experiences, what 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 we society, what 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 parents and teachers and you know everyone else, authority figures, you know we sort of um, we schooled that out of them, right? Um, we we no longer want the sort of free exercise of learning your limitations, and in some ways it's for good reason. We don't want we don't want people to hurt themselves. Um, we want people to be, you know, perhaps safe. But maybe more than that, and maybe not so noble, is that uh, we want to control people. Um, and so learning these lessons about one's abilities, their emotional thresholds, the, 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 the limitations of their, their mind's powers, their imagination's powers, um, their, their, their physical abilities, um, whatever those are, right? That these aren't, these aren't all the same, that we all have very different sort of um, arrays of very different temperaments, right? We're, we're, we're built differently, right? There's, there's similarities with this, but there's also lots of differences. Um, and Emerson here is saying that, you know, one of the things that we find out in learning um, is the interplay of all these different forces at work, emotional, natural phenomena, you know, God or whatever it is that God represents, and they're all interacting in this, in this sort of, you know, life drama. And he says, um, 
these laws that, that, that we learn, these laws of limit, these laws of cause, these laws of necessity, he says they refuse to be adequately stated. They will not be written out on paper or spoken by the time. Now, he's, he's not saying that we can't come up with scientific theories or with explanations for things. He's, he's not quite saying that. But what he's saying is that the process by which humans are sort of regularly born into the world, you know, trying to learn from those that came before them, um, expanding certain areas of knowledge and certain disciplines, you know, and doing all that work, that there's no end in nature in terms of explanations that finally come to a complete and total knowledge of, like, why things are the way that they are. That this is, he describes this, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an essay that you can find in this book if you want to look at it. He describes it in an essay called Circles. And in it, he talks about that, you know, he says life is an apprenticeship to the truth that around every circle another can be drawn. And that, and that act of circling or circumscription is a, that's like a, a theory that totalizes everything. Like, here's all the information, here's the explanation for it, you're welcome, right? But, you know, just give it a little bit of time and eventually um, it won't be adequate anymore and a new theory will be offered, right? And, and that's fine, that's okay. But what it tells us is that there's no final book, right? And again, what book do you think is coming to mind for people as he's you know, giving this presentation? Talking about a religious text, right? In this particular uh, you know, situation, that religious text is going to be you know, the, uh, the Bible, right? The Christian Bible. Um, and he's saying that, that, that the profundity of nature all of its mysteries and all the things that we can figure out about it and all of the things that we can come up to explain it, which is good, um, but ultimately it won't ever finally adequately, like we are done, we figured it all out, like that, that just won't happen. Um, and that the constant play um, of our lives, um, as we see children do, right, uh, is a, is a, is a perennial lesson for the species of how it is that we come to discover our finitude and that the the levels of finitude are going to vary based off of you know who we are and where we are and you know what are our gifts what are our particular limitations and again there are similarities between us right um, but that uh, when it comes to the vast array of you know possibilities within human life of different things. Not everybody can draw. Now, in some sense, everybody can draw, but not in the sense that not everybody can draw well. And, you know, if you really want to debate that, I guess you could, but I, but I think just that common idea, like, you could maybe learn to play the guitar a little bit, but not everybody can, you know, really play the guitar really well, right? Or sing, or dance, or, you know, um, go into business for themselves. Um, or, you know, uh, build a satellite, or, <clears throat> you know, whatever it is, right? And so, while Emerson is very optimistic and pro the cultivation of our human powers, he, you know, he's, there's difference. We're different, right? But in, in all those differences, there's this idea that we can't, we can't figure it all out in a, in a, in a very final way, right? So, so, these, these laws that permeate our existence, our, our social being, our exist, like our existential, you know, the unique elements of our existence, structure of our life, um, you know, that, that there, are, there are laws that won't be fully, finally, adequately stated. It's, a, it's an ongoing perennial activity. Hopefully that, hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's look at just a little bit more here. Uh, if you drop down, da, 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 he says, well, I'll pick up um, where I left off. They will not be written out on paper or spoken by the tongue. They elude our per, uh, persevering thought, yet we read them hourly in each other's faces, in each other's actions, in our own remorse. The moral traits draw globe into every virtuous act and thought and speech we must sever and describe or suggest by painful enumeration of many particulars. Yet, as this sentiment is the essence of all religion. So don't forget that. That's that's kind of like his 
main theme. He's going to make some points that we'll get into, but like the main argument here is that the sentiment, um, this this moral sentiment, the sentiment of virtue, is the essence of all religion, which which removes the exclusivity of Christianity. Which of course that's 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 a big deal for you know especially at that time and, and for a lot of people today as well. Um, let me guide your eye to the precise objects of the sentiment by an enumeration of some of those classes of facts in which this element is conspicuous, like, you know, which is like, it's obvious. Uh, it's, you can, you know, you can see it. He says the intuition of the moral sentiment is an insight of the perfection of the laws of the soul. These laws execute themselves. They enact themselves. They are, they are out of time and out of space and not subject to circumstance. Thus, in the soul of man, there is a justice whose retributions are instant and entire. He who does a good deed is instantly ennobled. He who does a mean deed is by the action itself contracted. Just a little bit more. He who puts off impurity thereby puts on purity. If a man is at heart just, then insofar as he God, the safety of God, the immortality of God, the majesty of God, do enter into that man with justice. If a man dissemble, deceive, or deceives himself and goes out of acquaintance with his own being, a man in the view of absolute goodness adores with total humility. Every step so downward as a step upward, the man who renounces himself comes to himself. I mean, um, I mean, obviously you can tell there's probably some some powerful, powerful language there, and, and, and to some maybe offensive, striking, dangerous language there. Um, but what I want to look at is his his sort of his version of a sort of virtue ethic in which he's saying the good deed is its own reward that is it's instantaneously ennobling the one who acts thusly who who does the virtuous thing and those who those who refuse to act virtuously um, they diminish right they they are contracted they become smaller um, they become less uh, human. Um, he says here, um, if a man is at heart just, then so far as he, God, the safety of God, the majesty of God, the majesty of God, do enter into the man. I mean, um, if you want to know where God is in, in, in the Emersonian, um, you know, uh, metaphysical uh, <laughs> account, um, look, forward in, look forward in virtuous deeds. Right. Look. Look forward in, in charity. Look forward in, you know, the various profound acts of justice that people undertake. That that, that that speaks to, what God really is. Not a discrete entity, um, that somehow transcends space and time and you know acts to you know miraculous or you know supernatural effects to violate you know, these laws and principles of nature. Um, but in humans, resisting, um, you know, habituated act or deceptive acts or wh however they might come about, when they're, when they're out of acquaintance with themselves and what they should be doing, um, that, 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 that God represents the, uh, represents that sentiment of, of, of virtue, that moral sentiment, you know that that's that's where God would be present, right? In humans doing good and doing good towards one another, um, which I think is a, a really uh, interesting way to think about God. You know, depending on you know where you're coming from and you know uh, where where your leanings are on religion or atheism or you know ag agnosticism or, or whatever it might be, that at at, at the very least, it's a it's a it's a provocative and powerful way of really um, wanting to give a, a meaningful account of human agency when it comes to the level of importance that we should place on what's at stake when we're acting virtuously or when we're when we're not acting virtuously. You know, that would be the absence of God, uh, but that God would be there. Um, in our kindness uh, towards one another, in our in our attempts at uh, justice, um, yeah, you know, um, there's there's a bit more to get to, but I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to get to the main stuff uh, in one more video. So I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, for now. 
give you, hopefully you have some things to think about. So until then, keep reading, uh, keep thinking.